Good morning. Good morning. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Wearing green, I learned, means that we are invisible to leprechauns, all the mischievous little creatures that I know plague my life. <laughs> Hopefully for a day, no mischief here. <laughs> and in a few days, it will turn spring. So happy spring to you all. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the South Fork. As Unitarian Universalists, we come together each week and more often sometimes to honor what is of worth. In this hour, we pause the everyday rush and flow of our lives in reverence and thanksgiving to connect to what is sacred whatever that is for you. To remember our commitments to each other and the world, whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on your life's journey, whatever your name for the sacred, you are very welcome to bring your whole selves here, whether or not you feel whole. My name is Pam Wittenberg, and I am your worship associate this morning. We extend a special welcome to those of you who are new to our congregation today, and I see many new faces. Do we have any who would like to introduce themselves? Please. Nice to have you in the house, Helen Doctorow. If you are visiting on Zoom, please sign our virtual guest book. Anyone new on Zoom? <laughs> okay. Someone from our Karen Connection is more than happy to reach out to any of you who are here. We hope that you will feel free to ask questions and to come again. It is with great pleasure to have as our worship leader today, a visiting Unitarian Universalist minister, Alyssa Lee. Originally from a suburb in Oklahoma City, Alyssa Lee, Lee served as an attorney, a mediator, a civil rights officer for a number of state agencies, um, and in Oklahoma, before she heard the call to become a UU minister, she recently graduated from Meadville Lombard Theological School with her Master's in Divinity and was welcomed into preliminary fellowship for UU, why is that? That's a typo. <laughs> for the ministry this past December. Alyssa is currently the minister for the Brookfield UU Church in Brookfield, Massachusetts, and resides in Hudson, Massachusetts, with her husband and seven-year-old son. Today, Alyssa will be presenting, Is Love Really All We Need? A sermon inspired by a Bell Hooks novel, All About Love. Thank you so much for being here, and to all of you. Our musician is our own Sarah Gordon on the violin, who will, is also a wonderful singer. Sarah also serves as the vice president of our board. Thank you, Sarah. Our tech hosts are Carl Wittenberg Berg in the back and Monika Sasada on camera. We have hearing assisted devices, if anyone should need one, and they work best on this side of the room. Okay. We welcome children. I don't see any. <laughs> so, well, there's Kim back there. She's our child, wonderful child care. As a reminder to us all in the room, oh, as a reminder to all of us in the room, please silence your phones. And if you are on Zoom, please mute yourself during service until you need to share something. Thank you. Let us take a moment to please pass the peace with each other um, in person and on the chat. You just turn to your neighbor and greet them. You can even walk across the room if you want to. And I'll call you back in a minute. <laughs> 
Whether you are joining us in the meeting house or from your home, we invite you to settle into this sacred hour free from distractions. We will be listening to music that Sarah Gordon will play, Festival Waltz, an American traditional. Thank you for that wonderful music. Good morning. Um, as, as Pam said, my name is Alyssa Lee, um, and I'm so grateful to be here with you this morning. The Article 2 revisions of our UU bylaws remind us that our Unitarian Universalist faith calls us to put love at the center, to be accountable to one another for doing the work of living our shared values through the spiritual discipline of love. Though living with this ethic of love may sound easy in theory, it can be difficult in practice, especially when we're faced with those who would oppress us or the people we care about, or when we're losing hope or overwhelmed by all the world is demanding of us. How do we find the spiritual reserves to put love into action? to demonstrate that the boundary of our love is not decided by someone else's anger or resentment, but is instead driven by our own deep empathy and a call to create and maintain the kind of world we want the young people in our lives to inherit. I hope you will help join me now as we begin our worship together. And as we light this chalice, We'll have a special guest light it for us. Let the flame be a symbol of our commitment to one another and to our imperfect and yet life-giving faith. During our time together, may we hold each other in grace and compassion and be guided by our shared understanding that we want to co-create a faith that is rooted in love and communal caring. Let us live into our values as we share this brief time together today. Thank you so much for doing that. I hope you'll join us for the first hymn, number 354 in your Graham hymnal, We Laugh, We Cry, and please rise as you feel willing or able.
we did a great job. <laughs> we gave it the old college try. <laughs> um, our first message today is going to be a book um, called Love by Matt De La Pena. which I actually have signed by the author. Very exciting. <laughs> I want to make sure. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Great. In the beginning, there is light and two wide-eyed eyes, wide -eyed figures standing near the foot of your bed, and the sound of their voices is love. A cab driver plays love softly on his radio while you bounce in back with the bumps of the city. And everything smells new, and it smells like life. Love, too, is the smell of crashing waves and a train whistling blindly in the distance. And each night, the sky above your trailer turns the color of love. In a crowded concrete park, you toddle toward summer sprinklers while older kids skip rope and run up the slide. And soon you are running among them and the echo of your laughter is love. On the night the fire alarm blares, you're pulled from sleep and whisked into the street where a quiet old lady is pointing to the sky Stars shine long after they've flamed out, she tells you, and the shine they shine with is love. But it's not only stars that flame out, you discover. It's summers, too, and friendships and people. One day you find your family nervously huddled around the TV, but when you asked what happened, they answer with silence and shift between you and the screen. In your dream that night, you are searching for a love that seems lost. You open and close drawers, lift cushions, empty old toy bins, but there's nothing. You wake with the start in the arms of a loved one who bends to your ear and whispers, it's okay, it's okay, it's love. And in time you learn to recognize a love overlooked, a love that wakes at dawn and rides to work on the bus, a slice of burned toast that tastes like love. And it's love and each deep crease of your grandfather's face as he lowers himself onto an overturned bucket to fish. And it's love and the rustling leaves of gnarled trees lined behind the flower fields. And it's love and the made up stories your uncles tell in the backyard between wild horseshoe throws. And the man in rags outside the subway station plays love notes that lift into the sky like tiny beacons of light. And the face staring back in the bathroom mirror, this too is love. So when the time comes for you to set off on your own, heavy winds will sweep past you, your building and great gray clouds will congregate above. Your loved ones will stand there like puddles beneath their umbrellas, holding you tight and kissing you and wishing you luck. But it won't be luck you'll leave with because you'll have love, you'll have love, love, love. 
so I'm curious, and this is for um, any, of those of, of any age, are there times when you have seen love in action, when you have seen either your own face staring back at you, or maybe you've seen something that someone's done that's demonstrated love to you in action? You don't have to share if you don't want to, but I would love to hear it. <laughs> An example that I can think of is um, two things. When my son was born, people from my church back in Oklahoma City brought me meals, and that felt like love in action because goodness knows I needed those meals. <laughs> um, and then I also think about in my, my home city of Oklahoma City, we had a teacher walk out. Um, the teachers were trying to protest um, for better conditions for the, the students, and that was love. That felt like love for their students or for their community. Does anyone else have a, an example they can think of? Certainly people from this lovely congregation have brought me meals and have driven me to and from doctor's appointments over the last months. So that's love. Yeah. While I have been unable to be as helping of a family member to my younger sister, Linda, uh, this community reached out and pick her up so that she could come here every Sunday. And also my sweet, wonderful Amy, who is my niece, also did the same. And it, it's just beautiful. And this Sunday, we're going to teach Linda how to order an Uber. And she is <laughs> now going to be Ubering um, over here because it's going to take a little while for her to get back in the car. So thank you, everyone who's helped my sister. Because guess what? I've had eye surgery. I can't read the hymnal. I can't really see well, and I haven't gotten clearance to drive yet. So that's love. Yes, it is. Thank you. Just maybe two more, and then we'll wrap it up. Well, in Hamlet, Shakespeare, character Polonius said, to thine own self be true, thou canst not then be false to anyone. You must, first of all, love yourself then you can help everyone. Yeah, and I think we have one more. Someone I thought I had given up on gave me a call on Saturday, <clears throat> and um, the relationship is renewed. That's lovely. All right, thank you all for, for joining me in that conversation. Inside your order of service um, are the announcements to put in your pocket, to put up on your refrigerator. Um, it was a tradition we used to do before COVID, and um, we're trying it. Are there any other announcements that are not in there? Okay. If you want to make an announcement, that you feel is important to the congregation, you bring that to the attention of Kelly, our administrator, on Tuesday of the week. Tuesday of the, yeah. It's always confusing even for me. I always aim for Tuesday. <laughs> we are in the time of our uh, service where we do our offering, the it supports the ongoing work of this congregation, which includes this service, programs, religious education and exploration, community care and connection. 
It's through the gift of our time, our talents, and our treasure as well. A, a basket will be circulated, which will be for a, a Sunday service. There's also a basket in the back for the Helping Hand Fund, which provides support to local organizations and our minister's discretionary fund. Online, there is a link that you can chat. While we are passing this basket, we'll listen to Sarah with her song, Banish Misfortune, an Irish jig. are the time of joys and concerns, sorrows. If you're in the meeting house, please come to this microphone if you'd like to share. We have candles here that you can light or can be lit for you. If you're online, please raise your hand or let us know in chat if you prayer or meditation. Let's take a deep breath in and out. Let's take another deep breath in and out. Spirit of life and love, holy mystery that holds us and calls us home to our true selves. We may have heard it said that all we need is love, that to care for one another is what will guide us through the darkest days. But many of us are perhaps starting to wonder if simply loving other people is enough. Or perhaps we're having difficulty even finding the love in the first place. We are called to put love at the center of our faith, but many of us may have a hard time finding it at the center of ourselves. How do we love when there is so much destruction, when there's so much to be angry about or even despair over? In these moments, may we be reminded that there is no perfection to be had that our capacity to forgive, our capacity for empathy, and our capacity to love is a journey that will at times be waylaid, but one that will continue throughout our lives and one we can always begin again. Even when times get difficult, maybe, may we be reminded of our better selves and if that better self gets lost, let us remember there is a community here that will help us find our way. I now invite you to spend just a few moments in stillness to breathe deeply and to remember a time when you have been held in love, when the warmth of this community or another has called you back to your true self.
I now invite you to join us for the next hymnal in your hymn in your teal hymnal. It's number 1008, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place. Thank you again to Sarah for this wonderful music. It's been just, just a delight. A year or so ago, my husband and I took our then six-year-old son to the American Heritage Museum, which is a military museum uh, just outside of Hudson, Massachusetts, where we live. They have mem military memorabilia from World War I to the current day. We thought he would love seeing all the tanks and big trucks, but instead, as many parents can, I'm sure, relate, he had the exact opposite reaction of what we were expecting. He was terrified. He clung to his dad and he asked to leave. And I realized that we had never told him about war. He didn't know about the Holocaust. He didn't know about Vietnam War. His life had been perfectly sheltered from so many of the terrors that growing up in this world can bring, and I struggled with how to explain it all, especially as the reality of almost 100 years of human suffering was just there on display for him. And as this experience stayed with me for weeks um, and the months after, it occurred to me that I didn't really have to explain what those tanks were there to do. He understood on a visceral level in a way that many of us adults don't allow ourselves to know anymore. He wasn't able to hide from the reality of this world in that moment, and neither was I. And I think 
That is what stayed with me. It was all there on display, and I felt the need to explain it, and I couldn't. The sinking feeling stayed with me as well, but also a question. This question of how do we explain to the children in our lives that though there is great love in this world, there is also suffering. That people can forget the humanity of others and sometimes themselves. And what do we do about that? Whenever there is a major tragedy, many people make reference to Mr. Rogers' famous advice. He said, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. But his advice was for children, not for adults. And while it can be of great comfort for children to look to the helpers so that they can see that the world is still made up of people who care for them and will keep them safe, Adults are called to something more. We are called to be the helpers, to look in the face of great tragedy and find the space to love people through the hurt, to let the lives we lead be a reflection of our internal values and to act from an ethic of love. In her book, All About Love, the author Bell Hooks talks about living with this ethic of love. She stresses the importance of understanding love, not just as a feeling we have, but as a call to action. When faced with moments that we can't understand, or when we look into the face of senseless tragedy and can't recognize ourselves or where to turn, it can be difficult to find hope, to understand where the love could be and how we can make sense of a world that contains such heartbreak. And you may be thinking about a time that this most true for you. Quite a few people have told me that they feel hopeless right now. They look at climate change, senseless gun violence, the upcoming national elections, and the oppression of people of color and trans members of our communities. And they feel overwhelmed and without any sense of what to do. So in these moments, perhaps a turn to action a recognition of our role as helpers can be a guiding light for many of us. For a while, I was a legislative liaison, which is basically a lobbyist for government agencies at the state capitol in Oklahoma City. I represented a human service agency um, whose mission was to keep children and other vulnerable populations safe. So as one can guess, we were not uh, always the most popular people to darken some of these very conservative legislators' doors. It was difficult work, and my day was often filled with choosing to speak to people who were either openly, openly hostile to me, or would be kind to my face and then stab me in the back, or people who were ostensibly on my side but undermined me at every turn. I sat through hours of committee meetings and watched legislators work to undermine the rights of women and LGBTQIA members of my community, as well as take actions that I thought would make the world less safe for education, um, sorry, would make the world less safe or education less accessible for the children in my community. So one might presume that this was soul-sucking work that left me depleted and empty at the end of a legislative session. But it wasn't. Though it was hard and I had to swallow many of my feelings, having a purpose made a difference. It somehow made it all easier. I'm sure there are among, many amongst you teachers, medical professionals, social workers, and numerous other caregivers for the most vulnerable in our communities who recognize this feeling. That the world is hard, but maybe I can work to make my little corner of the universe a little less difficult. When I became a Unitarian Universalist, what was remarkable to me, most of all, was that there was less talk about shoring up our treasures in heaven, as had been much of the religious teachings of my youth, but rather conversations were centered around what are we doing with our time here on earth right now? 
How are both our individual and collective actions affecting the world we are currently living in? And that, to me, is the core of how we take care of the most vulnerable in our society, as well as what we're called to teach the children amongst us. We teach them that love is an action that we choose to take, rather than always a feeling. We can choose to see the inherent worth and dignity in others, and we can choose how we manifest that sense of understanding into, belong, into being. So I believe there are three fundamental facets of putting that love into action. First is to identify our empathy, and with that, recognize the humanity in everyone we encounter. Second, it is to do the internal work necessary to ensure we have the proper vision before acting. And of course, third is the action itself. So as we embark upon a new year of a national election season, many of us are likely already exhausted by the news coverage. I know I am. I know it can be hard to find empathy for the people we feel are threatening the safety of the marginalized voices in our communities. But I can tell you that being from Oklahoma, it was difficult to read comments online made by people in more progressive states saying, we basically brought it on ourselves with who we're electing. We were feeling the deepest sting of what was happening where we live, and many of us were working every day to fight it, and we felt abandoned, or at the very least, misunderstood by the people in the rest of the country. Some empathy and perhaps words of encouragement would have likely done wonders for our capacity to just keep going. And additionally, I think many of us can recognize that there are often larger systemic issues at play that create systems in which people may vote against what we feel is their own best interest. Either way, I've never heard of anyone changing their position when they're being harshly judged or dismissed. But the empathy often isn't for them anyway. It's for ourselves. Those of us who are reading the news every day and feeling the pit in our stomachs. There's a quote that's often misattributed to the Buddha, which basically says that anger is like drinking poison and expecting someone else to die. There's, <laughs> there's a reason this quote has been misattributed to a number of speakers throughout the ages, because it rings true for many of us. Our anger, our bitterness, they hurt us. And often because we're blinded by that anger and sometimes unwilling to compromise or find empathy because of it, we can hurt the very people we're trying to help. Perhaps living within an ethic of love and leading with empathy in our interactions with others can be an antidote to that poison. The second piece of love and action is contemplation, to be thoughtful, to have a plan before you act. Of course, this notion of contemplation before action can be difficult for many of us. I don't know about you, but my immediate response is to want to jump in and get involved, and I get frustrated when I feel like people are spending too much time talking and not enough time doing. However, I was moved by a section in a biography of the Reverend Howard Thurman in which the author Paul Harvey recounts a story in which the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was stabbed and almost killed at one of his book signings in 1958. Reverend Thurman visited Dr. King in the hospital and encouraged him, as he encouraged many people, to look at this as an opportunity to take a brief step away from the everyday, focus on his life, and meditate on its purpose, and then move forward. And this was at the core of Thurman's teachings, to take time to contemplate your inner life so that you may commune with God or the universe and later, and later act with purpose. In addition to being able to act with precision and purpose, there's also an internal resilience that we need to manifest. A wise friend recently told me something her spiritual teacher told her. She said, you have to hold a gallon to give a cup. 
So in other words, you have to care for yourself and do the internal work necessary to ensure you are able to put love into action. Again, this is going to be a difficult year for many of us. We will want to act, we will want to take part, but if our cups are dry and there are no reserves to refill it, then we will have nothing to give. So this leads us to the third piece of putting love into action, the action part. So it's worth noting that Reverend Thurman encouraged the Reverend Dr. King to meditate on his purpose, but he also recognized that people have a duty to step back into life, pursue community, and take responsibility for the nature of the social order. And I certainly worry about an excessive amount of navel gazing without action. That can sometimes take place within our UU movement. We do love a book club, after all. So we have to be careful not to get too bogged down in focusing on our own internal liberation that we forget about the external liberation that is at the heart of our faith. Because giving, helping, especially when times are tough, can be a spiritual practice as much as any. What we do in our community and how we act towards others shapes our inner lives more than we sometimes believe or even recognize. How many times have you volunteered somewhere and come away from it learning more than you likely taught others? Have you gone to a community event or helped someone who could use a hand and felt a tiny piece of your soul was liberated in the process? I know I have. When we live our lives with a focus on fierce love and action that we can share with our families, friends, and communities, we decenter ourselves and our hangups and fears and inch ever closer to the beloved community that the Reverend Dr. King spoke about so many decades ago. But this notion of living in love rather than fear is a difficult one. Personally, I'm living with a lot of fear right now. I think many of us are. Certainly many people of color, trans people, and other members of our communities living with marginalized identities are living with a fear that I cannot possibly understand. And I wanna affirm that this fear is real and it is valid. And for the rest of us who are not living within that sphere of very real and immediate danger, our job is to surround the members of our community in love and to take action when they need to focus on their own survival and emotional well-being. So when this fear threatens to overtake us, how can we keep our wits about us when those we care about are being threatened? The role we have to play in our communities is unique and personal to every individual, but we can rest assured that it is needed, that we as you use collectively are needed, and reminding ourselves and others that we are on the side of love is needed. Amen, and may it be so. I hope you'll join us for hymn, uh, 1014 in the Teal Hymnal. It's called Answering the Call of Love. Please uh, rise as you are willing or able.
appreciate you all going on this journey with me for my, what might be somewhat unfamiliar hymns, so I appreciate that. <laughs> and again, thank you so much for having me here today. It's been such a, such a joy to meet all of you and worship with you today. Sustained by the time we spent together, as we journey away from one another into the week ahead, let us be reminded by our faith's call to love and radical empathy. May the love and support of this community remain with you today and throughout this week until you find yourselves back here again. Amen. We'll now extinguish the chalice. Do you mind doing the honors, Pam? <laughs> we extinguish this flame, but not the light of our truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Of all the money that e'er I had, I spent it in good company, and all the harm I've ever done, alas, it was to none but me. And all I've done for want of wit, to memory now I can't recall. So fill to me the parting glass. Good night and joy be with you all. So fill to me the parting glass and raise a glass for health to all. And gently rise and softly call Good night and joy be with you all. For all the comrades that e'er I had, they're sorry for me going away. And all the sweethearts that e'er I had, that wished me one more day to stay. But since it fell into my lot that I should rise and you should not, I'll gently rise and softly call. Good night and joy be to you all. So fill to me the parting glass and raise a glass for health to all. And gently rise and softly call. Good night and joy be to you all. Good night and love be to you all.